Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod and patronize me. Now I'm going to dive right into this one. Um, well, actually, I'm not going to dive into this one. Uh, this episode is supposed to go up next week. None of this is going to matter to you guys because you're listening to it whenever you feel like listening to it. But originally, the Ben Catcher show was going to go up in November, and there was another one that was going to go up in the end of October. But that guest hasn't gotten back to me about a little thing that I want to make sure is... Um, approvable on his end. So on the face of that, I decided to take one of my in the can episodes and go ahead with that. So what you're getting this week, now that I've gone through that rambling, rambling premise is a new episode with Ben Catcher. Longtime listeners of the show know that I did a live podcast with Ben a couple of years ago uh, as part of his New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium, but um, we decided to do a one-on-one -on -one this time, um, which I'll get into in just a second. First, Ben Catcher, for those of you who don't know him, is one of my all-time favorite cartoonists. Um, I was following his Julius Knippel real estate photographer strips in the, well, I think it was in the Village Voice where it was syndicated when I was in college. Um, and it sort of blew my mind in this, this, um, very strange and lonely way that it described, uh, lost New York City. So Ben was one of the first guests I, I had hoped to get for the show. And when he assented, he did say we need to do a live one. And, um, that was a, a kind of insane process from a technical standpoint. I think I was more at ease with talking in front of 50 or 60 people than I was with figuring out how to mic an entire room just for recording, not, not for amplification. Um, plus having to figure out how to get the audience's questions on tape and then splice those into the cut of the show. And, um, and of course, because it's me, I also had to have this whole redundant recording setup going on, but, but it worked out fine. All things considered. Um, well, the recording did. In fact, when we, Ben and I recorded back in 2013, he did hang me out to dry on the first goddamn question that I asked, but I rolled with it and it, it was a good learning experience for me. Um, and you know, gave me something to, to goof about when I talked to other cartoonists about doing the show sometime. So anyway, this time around, because this is all about this episode and not 2013, uh, I asked Ben when we were at the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus event, also known as CXC, uh, if he was interested in doing a follow-up, just a little sit down uh, to see how things had changed in the last three and a half years. Um, and just, you know, to kind of measure myself against how we talk then versus how we talk now. So we got together uh, Saturday uh, evening, right after the exhibition finished, and recorded in the garden behind the Metropolitan Library where the, the main stuff was being held. Uh, ben was out in Columbus to promote the 25th anniversary edition of Cheap Novelties, The Pleasures of Urban Decay, which is being published by Drawn and Quarterly. Cheap Novelties is the first collection of Ben's Julius Knippel comic strips, and um, and they really are some of my favorite work in comics. Uh, like I was trying to say, there are these, these little Joycean epiphanies about life in, in this urban milieu, this sort of time lost New York City that, um, I hearken back to without ever having experienced it in person, uh, which I think is the point. Um, but they're just these gorgeous and strange and, and lonely comics, which probably says more about me than, than them. But anyway, um, the important thing is that 
Cheap Novelties is out now, uh, the 25th anniversary edition. It is in a much better format than the original Penguin edition, which Ben will talk about. Um, and you should pick it up. It's from Drawn and Quarterly. Now, our caveats for this one, uh, as I mentioned, we recorded outdoors. Um, ben moved off mic a couple of times. And there was a drone strike during the episode. Um, you'll know when that comes. I'll, I'll break in and explain that to you. Now, here's Ben's bio from Drawn and Quarterly's website. Ben Catcher lives in New York, where he's an associate professor at Parsons School of Design, the new school. As director of Parsons' illustration program, he runs the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium, a weekly lecture series for the study of text image work. He has been the recipient of both a Guggenheim Fellowship and a MacArthur Fellowship. Along with his long-running comic strip work, Julius Knippel, real estate photographer, The Cardboard Valise, Hotel and Farm, The Jew of New York, and a monthly strip for Metropolis Magazine, Catcher has also collaborated with musician Mark Mulcahy on a number of works for musical theater. These works include The Rosenbach Company, a tragic comedy about the life and times of Abe Rosenbach, the preeminent rare book dealer of the 20th century, The Slug Bearers of Carroll Island, or The Friends of Dr. Rushour, an absurdist romance about the chemical emissions and addictive soft drinks of a ruined tropical factory island, a check room romance about the culture and architecture of coat check rooms, and Up from the Stacks, about a page working the stacks of the New York Public Library in 1975. Catcher is the only cartoonist to have won an Obie for Best New American Work for his libretto and drawings for the Carbon Copy Building, a collaboration with Bang on a Can. His TED Talk is titled Comics of Bygone New York. And now, the new Virtual Memories Conversation with Ben Catcher. So it's been like three years since we did our thing. Oh, right, at the symposium. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, we did a live one. You, you're you just reissuing, you're not reissuing, Drawn right. and Quarterly is reissuing your first collection, right. Cheap Novelties. What was it like looking back at that work? Did you have well, to look back, or did you just like no, hand it to them and run away? No, I don't have to look at it too much, because it's all been scanned for uh, other editions. I worked on the packaging with um, their designer, and they're, you know, in this infinite patience that, like, I mean, that's very unlike working with uh, bigger publishers. And um, so, yeah, it's the way it, I wished it looked at the beginning, but it couldn't because it was a little penguin, uh, small paperback. Yeah. But, uh, no, but it's um, amazing to think there's, uh, there's at least one generation of people, maybe two by now. What do you think? A generation is 10 years? I, I go 20, 25 years, 25? but in arts, it's, yeah, but, it's a narrower field. It's but, a narrower time span. Right. So some, yeah, so all these people who weren't born or were babies yeah. when this came out, and now they're going to look at it and try to say, what does this mean? You know, how does this even yeah, what, relate to us? But that's What's the, the Lost City? Uh, because a lot of what those Julius Knippel strips were about was yeah. a city that was already lost. Yeah, and so, what's it like looking uh, a quarter century later at that? Yeah, it's like they asked the guy, the minister of the Black Panther Party, who got out of prison after 35 years, you know, how does it compare now for uh, black people in Baltimore, and he said, oh, it's infinitely worse. So, yeah, that's the yeah, answer. It's infinitely <laughs> worse. It's whatever I was seeing. There was the a golden mall. age. Well, look yeah. at this city. I mean, we're in yeah. like a parking lot park. I don't, it's a yeah. city of parking lots. This is a well, weird city. They still have some yeah. nice artsy areas, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, at that's least, true. which is, you know, a that's step up from... Some place. Uh, yeah. Especially from the time I recorded with you last, I've, I've done a lot of shows with artists and writers who were based who had been based in new york and to every one of them yeah. they all left you know it's just i can't afford to live in new york city or at yeah least I, can't I mean i was Manhattan. born there and i you know moved into where i'm living 25 years i don't know not 25 but 20 years ago so it was barely affordable then and i'm still there i have i teach so i have to be there but um no it's it's sort of whatever was going on then. It's in this like end game, like a, how many few? I mean, there are parts of the city that's just a bank, a Duane, you know, a Dwayne, Dwayne Reed, Reed yeah. a bank, and, Starbucks. and a star. I mean, or some other chain. And it's 
there are vac- stores that are vacant you know, on Broadway in this prime real estate because yeah. they're, way, they're not going to rent it to someone for anything less than what they can get from a big corporate uh, chain. Yeah. So it's an end. It feels like it's like... Um, it's hitting like, a terminal yeah, point. But yeah. did it feel like that then? 25 years ago or longer? Uh, did you feel no, like things no. were No, things hopeless? were every week... My favorite old restaurants would close. You know, it was a feeling of things ending all around you, but they were still there to end. So, uh, you know. I mean, if you go out to the boroughs and parts of Brooklyn and the edges of, I mean, other cities, if you go up to uh, little old industrial cities, they're still, they haven't been so squeezed dry yet, but... uh, that's uh, what's happening. So, uh, but that's you know that's a selfish view of what's happening yeah, because that just makes it boring for me as a flaneur to take walks. But the to- the yeah. other angle is nobody's making a living in these kind of business. It's all part-time jobs and uh, service industry. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. sort of the non-jobs for all these people. So, uh, yeah, that's what's worse about it. It's, I mean, I'm not complaining about it. I can, oh, we can look always at old pictures and go to another city and take a walk. Yeah. So, uh, now, how have you changed in that, that span? Did it make you at all think about, you know, who uh, you were 25 years ago? No. Uh, or am I going to make you do yeah, that Yeah, I now? don't. But, uh, but um you know, no. No, it just makes me realize that these are all uh, art and whatever you call this thing, comics, yeah. um, how much it's a uh, product of its moment. And it's like that I feel like it only could have happened at that moment, the kind of art training I had, the kind of literary world that was in place at that time, that you know, everybody was reading these books that everybody heard of and knew about. Mm -hmm. They are centralized, old-fashioned culture. And uh, that it was a product of all that. And, uh, yeah, that's all. It makes me just realize that that's, um, yeah, the cultural history of this trip was of its moment. I mean, these things, uh, yeah, that's really the main thing it made me think about how how did these things all come together at that time? Yeah. And you know. Do you recognize yourself in those strips? Do you look back no, at strips no. and think, man, I do not remember who I was? No, I don't, I don't think these things are for me to read. I don't yeah. think most writers or no. cartoonists yeah. or pay, look at, unless they're complete narcissists, they don't, why would I want to? Yeah. I mean, I just, I'm just sort of amazed that I had the energy to do it. And I, you know, one time I was doing two weeklies and a monthly, which just seems now like, you know, like an impossibility, but I did it. So I look at the energy and that's about it. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> They're not for me. Yeah, I mean, I can't understood. look at them yeah. when I do a news strip. I, I feel like I've made this thing and put a certain cra- level of craftsmanship in whatever this idea was and it could that so that it could be um enjoyed by a reader and they'll get something out of that but i may i mean yeah that's um not for me sure i don't think to get that i'm just like it's just like this agony and then this moment of it's finished Mm -hmm. and that's all it is for me a less agony (laughs) and when i make in the middle of it it's complete you know, I don't know what I'm doing. and how Has it ever gotten make... easier? No, it gets harder. Yeah. How could it? No, not, not at all. It's no harder and harder because I've written, when you work in a serial form, it's like you've written a thousand short stories. Columnists. Yeah. I think it's more like a, a newspaper that, yeah, yeah. columnist where you start running out of... Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean... I don't do a weekly. I do this monthly and I'm working on these books... But, uh, yeah, no, you just look at it and say, how does any human have that much to say about anything? Mm-hmm. And But that's called, uh, 
It's approached like a public utility. Who says Con Edison has the can make energy every yeah. day? They do it somehow because people job. need it. Yeah. Okay. So I did it somehow because it was a great uh, kind of way to make a living. And, um, you know, no, it's not. Uh, can only look back that I did, was able to do it and say that's that's an amazing amount of uh, mental energy or hand draw and energy. I don't know, mm-hmm. but not to appreciate it like a some like reading. Some, yeah, like reading. I meet these people we're talking about some book I did, and <laughs> and I mean I, they they think I can understand what they why they were so delighted by it, but mm-hmm. I can't. Yeah, I just can't. That's why I don't. I never cite any of your strips around you for for that reason. Oh, you know, yeah, you, I just well, figure you know. Uh, I don't want people don't citing my old episodes. That. What? Uh, yeah. I don't want people because yeah. people do that. Say, oh, do you remember when you said this? I'm like, I don't remember that at all. But yeah. it was three weeks no, ago. Um, yeah. Oh, that's how this stuff should be. It's like. Um, do you have a better idea of who your audience is? From uh, then to now, or has that changed? No, because all I know is. The one common denominator that remains is that they, the people who say to me, I don't read comics, but I read your strip. Yeah. That's the only con. Otherwise, no, they're from all over the place. I can't see any common denominator. Uh, mathematicians, accountants. <laughs> No, well, at least it, I there's a number it. thing there, but yeah, I figured I you might have no, an architecture no. thing or urban no. planners might be interested, uh, but you know. But it's really just... Uh, I don't think it's. I've ever got that. I mean, I've never done a real um, statistical survey, yeah. so I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I know that's what people always say to me. Mm-hmm. So, How have things changed just in the, the few years since we talked? Uh, we did a, a live one a few years ago. Have there been oh. any major, major changes or... In what? Oh, in... Uh, you, in life and what you're working on. I'm teaching full... T- I was teaching full time. I think you were. Then, yeah. yeah. And now I'm the, I rotated into the directorship of the program. You have to do that every three years, somebody. Yeah. So I'm getting a sense of how uh, art, private art schools work. Mm-hmm. That's a different kind of life. See how these doing that kind of um, administrative uh, work, collaborating with other people. Um, but uh, how else? I think, yeah, I, I was never, my um, father was very involved in politics and, um, you know, took me to the, visit the SDS mm-hmm. when I was a teenager. I had no interest in going there. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I've become more interested in, um, in those questions now. And I wa- that it wasn't as I was growing up. In terms of social I, yeah, yeah. justice? And, I was yeah. just, wanted to make comics and I was this, um, yeah, I don't know what my, my interests were like to figure out what's going on. I didn't even know what was going on, so how could I not like, you know, I think you spend the first 20 years of your life figuring out how the culture works. Another twenty years figuring out how to have a place in that call, make a living in that call, mm-hmm. and then maybe the last you're in oblivion. You know, you you said, <laughs> "What did I do?" Or no. you said, "You know, how can this go on?" Yes. Yeah, so or you end up of, in the directorship yeah. of a, a, a oh, private art school. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of a program, and yeah. not of the school. I oh, okay. I don't think that that's something they would trust you with. I'm just kidding. That's that's. I don't know, but <laughs> probably. It's um, that's a whole nother level of uh, administrative commitment mm-hmm. that I don't. It's a kind of a real full time. I don't even yeah. get your summers off. Right. I don't think I would go that far. Mm-hmm. But uh, but you know, uh, actually, I want to <laughs> ask a little about the the place in in culture thing because I know you like me and, and other guys you know who have had the same path except I didn't actually create anything. You um, you dug the 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 genre comics when you were young, the superhero world, you know things oh, like yeah. that when you were a kid. Well, what yeah. was that evolution from that into becoming an artist? We'll say a literary yeah. cartoonist, which That's I know is freighted with meaning. We saw, and I saw 
Chester Gould also. Yeah. I didn't, and I knew that was more interesting than what was ha- what was happening in comics, even yeah. as a child. Dick Tracy, I knew that, that, Dick that, Tracy, that, yeah. and even uh, Little Orphan Annie was still running. With, yeah. uh, Harold Gray was still working, and I knew the texture of these things was this incredibly rich thing that I didn't get when I bought a comic book. Okay. So I knew, I knew that as a child. So you had that as a stepping stone. I don't know. How, sort I of mean, progression. You didn't... from my earliest memories of those things, looking at the, uh, you know, the Daily News or whatever Dick yeah. Tracy was running. So, so yeah, so it was... Um, and I, you know, next to that, all of that stuff, children's books seemed like this utterly boring, sterile yep. where I couldn't look at that stuff once you could look at comics. So that was a big, um, between comics and movies and uh, TV. It's not like, uh, yeah, that was when there was not much, that was what was offered to me. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, in co- it was this moment, and I was in fandom and comic fandom publishing magazines when I was yeah. a teenager. So the idea of publishing was completely part of my childhood, mm-hmm. trying to put these things out, these zines out. And they were more in the world of uh, not talking about this, the comics, but making comics. Okay. There was a sort of a, a two craft different world aspect yeah. to it. No, no, making original work. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought you meant the content was about making stuff. No, no, it was. We were making. Okay. I was yeah. making original stories. Yeah. It wasn't talking about. I, yeah, that I wasn't too interesting to me to talk about the industry or anything like that. There were people who did that. You know, mm-hmm. like the Comics Journal was right. doing that. So no, these were fanzines. They were really comic books, you know, yeah. alternative comics we were making. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then, you know, in college, this, I mean, none of this stuff was valid as a as a form in those years. So in school, you were in a writing program or in an art program and mixing them. Nobody saw how they mixed unless you had a, a drama class or, or if you actually staged something yeah. where you would... Were making we were, people were not making film in school when I was going to not in high school in college, but even there these were strong disciplines that were trying to be still be somewhat pure. So it wasn't, and there was no um, large cultural uh, validation for this form when I was, you know, through the '60s and '70s. It was underground comics was just like step above pornography or something. I yeah. mean, or below, depending yeah, on who below. you were reading. Yeah. But uh, yeah. so to do comics, to go to a college and study painting and literature and then say, no, I'm going to make comics was, you know, this would have been career suicide. Like, what yeah. you could be a painter. Why don't you want to be a painter? Why don't you want to be a writer? Mm-hmm. And I did. I knew this. I didn't like galleries, and I didn't like uh, tech, pure text-driven stories. I wanted this. I could have made movies. I, I played with cameras, movie cameras, when I was a kid. And I think if it wasn't such a collaborative thing, I, I might have say, made yeah. movies. I don't know. I mean, I shot these little spy epics when I was a kid, but. Um, but I guess I liked um, drawing instead of photography, and that's so. Uh, so anyway, after school, when I saw these were not viable directions, I said, "Well, of course I can make comics," and they were, you know, I knew they were underground comics, and I saw really serious things being made. They were not commercial; they were as poetic as anything I had seen in poetry and in literature and yeah. i said of course you can do this of course you can yeah. make uh comics that are serious and i did it and there was no more you know if you brought these things into a comic shop then they they literally couldn't recognize them as comics yeah much less one think they couldn't sell them they, they wouldn't even recognize these things they didn't look like comics yeah or not enough uh the, the anyway 
So, uh, yeah, that was not a... So I made a living uh, doing typesetting and um, graphics for 10 years and then slowly figured out how I could... Uh, it was through newspaper, yeah. the Knipple thing in newspapers. I said, okay, there's a way to reach a big enough audience to subsidize this work, you know, through advertising, whatever the yeah. way newspapers... The syndicated... Oh, well, they were, yeah, they model. were not... Yeah. I self-syndicated. Yeah. The syndicates would never touch this stuff. Yeah, that they, makes sense. Some of them saw it and said, no, they can't. Yeah. This is not even... And did you look at someone like Pfeiffer as a... This is the guy who yeah, had a, an all-weekly thing? he was one of these people. Uh, you know, newspaper comics was so... Uh, dead at that time to me that the whole idea of working in a newspaper was something I'd never considered. Mm -hmm. And this uh, fellow, uh, Russ Smith, who came up to New York to start the, um, the uh, New York Press, wanted to commission new comic strips. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to just pick up... Uh, Linda Barry was running already. Matt Groening had a yeah. weekly. A few others... Uh, he wanted original strips for his New York paper, and he that's how it happened. I mean, it wouldn't have crossed my mind yeah. ever to work in a newspaper. So that shows you, I mean, culturally how, like, blinded people are. Like, that's, I did thought what was there was, they would never run the kind of stuff I wanted to do. Even though, yeah, Pfeiffer was there, there weren't too many models yeah. It was and, more uh, comics, uh, underground comics, alternative, early yeah. arcade. I saw stuff like that. And you wouldn't have seen yourself necessarily as a comparable to a Pfeiffer and a Matt Groening. That's a very different style of cartooning than you were, uh, you were engaged in. I don't know. I think maybe it was more um, topical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never wanted to do those kind of um, where you actually refer to living yeah. People, not I don't know. Graining was a little less topical, I guess, but um, but a very anyway, it was the act, literally the format didn't I didn't understand why I would ever want to work in that format. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it turned out that's the only place I could have found a, a readership that wasn't interested in comics. So if I'd stayed in comics somehow, no, I, nothing would have had. I would never yeah. have had a readership. So it's a pretty lucky thing. Uh, and I did it, you know. They said, well, try it. You know, you, of course you don't have to do this if you don't. Doesn't. A lot of people started um, short runs of weeklies for him, and they, gave, they said, this is yeah. not for me. I can't. So, But for me, it worked. Uh, the format, I liked short things, the concise short stories. And I, and I got this feedback from readers that you would never get in the comics world. There's yeah. just not enough people. Uh, you almost get accidental audience. Yeah, like the accident. Yeah. yeah, and so that's how that worked. But um, so yeah, I tell these people here who are trying to sell like these comics that I mean, if you look at them, you realize the sensibilities are all over the place, yeah. and they'd maybe do better at a literary book festival. Some of them, and some of them would do better at a martial arts festival and some of them you know. yeah but i would not this is never was never if yeah, could, i could you imagine the profusion of of oh well no that's like because that. in the years i mean after um after raw and mouse got this gigantic critical acclaim i don't know you know i'm not a social historian of that how this all happened exactly, but I know that was a major uh, sort of wedge into the literary world. Mm -hmm. And then people could say, well, what I think they did is they looked at that and they said, well, let's look back at all this other stuff we thought was junk. Maybe there's some good stuff there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, exactly how that worked. But they became, it became a valid uh, form, like painting. It's a mixed medium mixed media, you know, your little writing, a little pictures. And now it's a completely valid form. If you tell your parents you want to go to college to study, uh, you know, graphic that, novels or text yeah. image work, I mean, they'd say, sure. I mean, it's, Does that uh, bum you out at all? 
Is there a degree of, you know, that the comics should be no, a little seedy? No, the danger or, or, you know. is of the academic solution to all this stuff. And that's what happens in all cultural things that become validated. Theorized and, and you say, well, this is how you do it. And then for some part of the population who want to have a valid career, they say, this is how you do it. And you go ahead and, you know, and you don't, uh, you know, there isn't this um, need to prove that you can do something of meaning in the form because we know you can and that I mean that, that's like the difference between you know yeah everything you can do it's done and now we just let's follow this model in some way and uh like how do we critique somebody has to like look at a whole um aesthetic of what a good graphic novel or comic is and say no maybe that's not the, all it can be it can be and that's that's a hard thing to do and i don't know if that happens just a few times every generation, somebody comes along and like revamps the whole idea of even what, what the, even now that you want to work in print, that could be maybe thrown in the gar in the dustbin of history. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And work with you know sound and time-based stuff. I don't know. I don't know, but um, yeah, that's the only. Uh, danger that I see is that um, like in 1950 how many people were writing poetry yeah. would you say 10 million young people? I don't know it's like it's nobody knows because everybody was doing it right. so maybe now is a, everybody has a friend who's making comics mm -hmm. it seems like that. that's what it looks like here yeah, yeah. well I I mean uh or do you happen to live in a cocoon? Yeah. Not a cocoon, but a, a self-selecting environment. I don't know. I like mean, I, I wanted to in the European countries where they sort of take note of who, who's working in these fields. They have numbers. Yeah. I don't think we had, know here, but um, somebody told me they had this number, and they seem to sort of have calculated it somehow by, and they said something like six thousand people. But I think it must be many more. Yeah. Just I with mean, the, the programs that are turning you? people out, all the yeah. mainstream employment. What's to stop employment? you from doing it? Yeah. Like, how many people are? We're writing short stories and poems, and it's now a valid form, just like those. I think the people who run our creative writing program tell me, you know, uh, applications for poetry are down. Mm -hmm. And I and I said, it's because these people are making comics. Yeah. And... Uh, so yeah, what's your feeling on the the maybe that's well, the, I thought the study that's where it should be making. taught out of the creative writing program as opposed to an art school because the art programs are very uh, uh, sort of rooted. Or, no, they're or, rooted in the art world and the mm -hmm. history of modernism and uh, all of this yeah. media specificity, which has nothing to do with comics. Comics predates all that. It's the you know the back to theater. And um, so, oh, what was the question? Oh, uh, the profusion of comics, uh, uh, comics in university, uh, I guess, in terms of teaching They're comics. They're not that many, yeah. really. A couple more comic studies than making. Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's your feeling in either of those areas? Well, comic is studies a, is being done as... As boring as, as most no, literary as studies? cultural studies. You could study milk container yeah. labels and learn what's going on in the... Yeah, they're, they're read as... Cultural, Just another cultural studies, yeah. not as literary studies, and that's so. Uh, you know, I know. I mean, it can be anything can be taught, anything can be done. I mean, I don't. I try to avoid. Uh, I mean, telling people that there, here's the solution. Mm -hmm. I tell them here's things you can look at, and um, to critique what the comics they like. So force them to say, this could be better. How can this be better? It's not, I mean, otherwise, what are we in some uh, perfect world? Of course they can be better. <laughs> yeah. So that's how you can teach it. I mean, the, and I mean, there are trade school comic places that are more trade schools that are feeding, you know, mainstream, the Joe Kubert school. Yeah. That exists still. 
that kind of place. But um, so yeah, that one of the courses I teach that's supposedly for graduate writing students who want to make comics. It's called experimental comics because I tell them if you want to make comics like the ones you see, go work as an apprentice for any vaguely successful cartoonist, and he'll show you how to do it. Yeah. We don't. You don't need to go to school. That's how it worked. You work. That's how comics worked, you know, before. And uh, but I said no. This is a place where we want to look at what we like and critique it and make it somehow better, make something not like what's happening. So we must say it's an experiment toward that end. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's how it works. The, are, you, are you working on anything experimental? You mentioned having a few books earlier, and I well, hate asking authors about thing. their... their yeah, you're still working big, on it. It's, okay. Yeah, it's for the text is finished. I'm just f making some more pictures for it, but... Uh, is it a comic no, thing uh, or illustrated it's text? illustrated text. Okay. Heavily illustrated, though. Yeah. So, uh, with maybe one or two comic thing moments in it, sequential things in it. But, yeah, for, no, for me... Right, writing history is experimental because I'm not a historian. Yeah. And I'm just uh, trying to figure out how to... Did you have a model as, uh, a, as prose writing goes? Is there somebody you, um, you look at? You know? No, Don't no. say Robert Caro because that means you're yeah, going to spend no. the next 40 years on this. So. No. Yeah. Well, I did spend... No, I spent... A, I've been working on this on and off for a long time. Yeah. But um, a model... Are there history writers? No, it's the voice of that my that I might have in my strip. Yeah, I think it's that voice. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I'm not modeling it after any particular. No, I didn't know if you had influences in terms of of prose, prose writing. writing compared to comics writing. Yeah, I, you got knowing how yeah. your your work isn't. <coughs> I don't want to say text heavy, but it's yeah. it's you know, you got captions. I That's read a, a lot, so everything I read somehow is influencing yeah. me. All these I've read a lot of. Um, uh, yeah, fiction and non-fiction, but to pick one person? No, I I don't okay. think it's that. It's a, it would make much sense because it would be a little piece of them or some. Yeah, it's the tone of how do you write a world history? How do you have the pretension to do such a thing? <laughs> so the tone has to be this mock pretension. Like here, I'm outlaying. Uh, here it is. From the Garden of Eden to this week, I'm going to sum it all up. So it's, yeah, it's the tone of an insane person who thinks they can do that. <laughs> and uh, how did you find yourself Do it? Yeah, what? doing that? Well, I, I, it's now, it's being presented as a outline to the history because the Will the history take 100 itself is, years to fill in the detail. Yeah. It's the broad outline of the history. Mm -hmm. I couldn't fill in every detail because no one knows these things yet. They may be discovered at some point. And so the, the outline is important mm -hmm. for people to say, okay, I know something about this thing that he didn't fill in, and they can start building it out. And mm -hmm. So I think that's what how I'm prepared. That's what it's being presented as, even though... As long as it's not a Joe Gould thing, that, that, that's okay. No, no, <laughs> it's, they, it's, you know, the, I'm, I, since I handed in the text, I've added one or two interviews, but um, no, it it's exists, it's just the pictures don't exist. Gotcha. I'm making a few more pictures, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I want to get it finished, because now that I see it in its... In its and it's you know the, the big outline yeah. of it. I can start uh, cutting things out that I think are not um, probably uh, enough of the. They don't fit an outline. They're kind of maybe anyway. They, well, that's too much of a, of a diversion from the main story. But but it's comp. It's yeah. I've never. Done anything of that I like it? So, to me, it's not it's not comics. But I don't know. I was reading about how can you keep, um, you know, experimenting within your own work. 
And if it's only possible to do that once, like it's a miracle you could have ever done it. Can you do it again? Can you keep... Uh, I think basically if you're if things line up culturally you could do it once and then uh, for, it to, for that to line up in the same way again where you'd want to completely rip apart what you've done and rethink it I think it's, life is too short to do that but you know when they say people reinvent themselves, usually they put on a new kind of clothing or something. Yeah. <laughs> They're not really... Most writers I and cartoonists I know it's a miracle. They figured something out mm -hmm. and they try to explore it as long as they can. And then uh, I don't think they have to... Uh, I mean, they're forced to do things they wouldn't have done just because it's the, the nature of it. You have to produce a lot of work. You can't just make like one comic strip and say, that there it is. I yeah. it's had, just to make a living, you have to produce a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Ouch. <laughs> but that's, you know, yeah, for me, I guess that was a strange thing to do when it could have been a comic strip. But... Um, I'm also as interested in illustrated text. It's all annotated, illustrated, illuminated, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's what pure prose doesn't want. Yeah, this is very different than a pure prose history. Uh, so, it's to me, it's not that different than comics. It just doesn't have. A, it has. Um, well, the words are outside yeah. the panels. Yeah, the yeah. text wraps around the image, and you sort of will know when to look at the picture. There, yeah, there are captions and things. I look so. forward to seeing it. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it either yet, in its finished form yeah. or whatever you. But the idea, anyway, of in this, um, you know, culture of. Uh, of information collection to put out a history is and seems insane anyway. Yeah. I mean it'll immediately I'll make a website for it and people every week someone keep, will say, you yeah, know, you didn't annotate know about it and that. keep adding more. And it'll just grow there. Yeah. I don't think you can make a book like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially a world history. Because uh I don't, I can't even read most of the languages of the world. So how could I? I can't research a lot of these places in a very meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I hopefully I'll start hearing from people, and they will either correct me or. So yeah. It, oh, the internet's full of people who yeah, want to correct you. Yeah. Trust me, that's. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's okay. That's good. I mean, yeah. I don't know what. Yeah. What this is? This is just too vast a subject. For anyone, I mean, I didn't hire like a team of graduate students to help me research yeah. this. I did it myself, and that's you know, I, I didn't want, I didn't approach it like a real historian would approach. It. Yeah. So. But you have so, people who are going to come along for the ride. Yeah, you have yeah. People who are going to say, you know, I want to see what Ben's. It's this strange. Yeah. It's a. It is. There is a big thesis to it like this is why this all ha what this all uh, leads to and what it means for people and the details uh you know they may be irretrievable most of history is irretrievable yeah. you know because it decayed it didn't have that much yeah substance uh, we only record the uh yeah. the you know the lives of kings you know well, or things that have any physical remains, I can, you know, yeah. the food was eaten, and uh, the people who ate it are dead, and they've been eaten, so there's not too much. <laughs> so, yeah, it's that kind of a history. It's a cultural history, and it's pretty ephemeral, and uh, that I could do it, do it at all is kind of a sort of... Miracle. Yeah, surprises me that I, yeah. So... Uh, and we'll this is see. why I don't ask people about their next book. That's oh, <laughs> for yeah, fear I don't of, talk you know. Much, I'm not yeah. talking about the book. I'm just yeah. talking about around. The whole process yeah, of I it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to talk about what the substance of it. No, no. It's, uh, you know, it's like talking about a joke or something. Yeah, yeah. you got to read the book. 
Yeah. Oh my god. Wait a second. It's a drone. Hi guys, it's Gil. Sorry to break in here, but this is that drone strike I alluded to earlier in the show. Uh, turns out, not a drone strike, just a medevac helicopter coming into the hospital nearby, but it put a damper on our conversation for a little bit, so I cut this part out. Yeah. So besides that, the uh, you're doing the regular monthly yeah, cartoon? That, is yeah, there any I other comics that. work you're... Uh... Uh, no, this uh, drawings toward this finishing up this book and that. I really what do. else? Um, I can't remember what else I'm doing. Oh, anyway, things, I guess, something maybe I shouldn't, I don't know if it's supposed to be announced, so I'll wait. I won't yeah, say, don't, don't, don't yeah. say it. I always tell people I'm under non-disclosure yeah. with like 500 different people, yeah. so, you know, no worries. I forget when they, when they, but that's a lot of work, the thing I'm going to, I'll tell you about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, tell me off mic. Mm. We'll, we'll let the, the audience wonder yeah. what it is. But, but um, yeah. What else am I doing? Well, but teach, you know, running this program, I have to hire a lot of uh, people. I mean, schools are run, you know, by by part-time teachers. And in the arts, that's sort of good for these people because they're busy. If they're, if they're lucky, they're busy with their work and they just want to teach one class or two classes a year. So I'm, but I get to uh, look at the work of a lot, like we're trying to, build out the animation programs i'm mm -hmm. looking at a lot of animation but and it's a, that's a lot of fun yeah but that takes time to look at this stuff i don't know how you make you know hopefully it makes a better school or better uh better influences for students you know but uh what else um that's yeah. that's it sounds like you've got an awful lot on your plate, frankly. Really? So. Yeah, I don't know. It's just yeah, I don't know what else. That's it, I think. Trying to go around selling. Are you happy cheap to see? Novelties. Are you happy to see cheap novelties back in print? Yeah, I mean, I actually have a lot of copies of the original. Somebody bought I've got up two or three of them. Yeah, but, somebody yeah. bought up the remainder when it was remaindered. So. But the thing is, they were hard. They were too small, and the, the whole thing. I never liked them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's better. It's more legible, better printing, better as an object yeah. for whatever that's worth. So yeah, I'm, and yeah. I'm just curious to see what this even means to people now. Yeah. If it, it I mean, that's a pretty interesting thing. If you're around long enough to see. Um, a revival of your another generation looking at it and you know maybe it'll be meaningless i don't know <laughs> i just don't know yeah yeah but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find we'll out. find out yeah. ben catcher okay. thanks so much for coming back on the virtual memory show oh thank you And that was Ben Catcher. Go visit catcher.com, and that's K-A-T-C-H-O-R.com for more about Ben's comics, operas, books, blog, and more. Uh, and also make sure you pick up the new 25th anniversary edition of Cheap Novelties, The Pleasures of Urban Decay, published by Drawn and Quarterly. It's a fantastic collection. Um, the fact that it's 25 years old doesn't really matter because it's hearkening back to a time prior to that that never really existed. So what it is is really amazing comics. And even if you have the original Penguin version, this one's got a lot better reproduction. So go pick up cheap novelties uh, available at better bookstores and comic shops. Also, Ben hosts the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium, and you can visit NY Comics Symposium dot wordpress dot com to learn more about that it meets just about every week in new york city and has some great topics and speakers so ny comics symposium and comics is plural uh, dot wordpress dot com for more about that after the main conversation i asked ben so who are you reading if you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our monthly podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. 
I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, a patron-only blog. I'm getting closer to launching a series of eBooks, which would be available first and foremost to my supporters and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. This one was recorded during CXC, the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus Festival. Um, because of some crazy work-related travel problems, I ended up paying something like $1,000 for two days in Columbus, Ohio. Um, not a great use of resources, I will admit, but I got to record with Ben, as well as Ed Corin. I got to meet Sergio Aragones. Um, I also made a bunch of new pals in the comics world, so that's more important than money, right? But still, if you do want to help defray some of my costs, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We've got the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at Facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with either Jim Woodring or Ed Corin. You'll have to come back and uh, find out which one I picked. If my voice is in better shape and I'm still getting over a head cold, uh, that episode's also going to feature my new Yom Kippur story, which is a weird one and entirely true. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, Look up the Virtual memory Show and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs>